Okay. Let's try again. Okay. I'm just going to, all right, people are coming back on. Excellent. This is a good sign. Hello. Oh, okay. So can you see me? Can you hear me? Those are the questions. Okay. We are here. Awesome. Oh my gosh. All right. Yay. That's so great. Um, <laughs> okay. So I kind of want to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago, where we were talking about when to quit. Um, if you, you know, you get into training and maybe you're competing and you, you're just not getting a good vibe with it. It's not getting better. You've poured in, um, whatever time and resources and commitment level that you want to put in and you are deciding mm, maybe this is not the sport for me. Maybe this is not the sport for my dog, those types of things. So if you want to hear kind of my process, go back a couple of weeks and listen to the beginning of that live chat if you weren't here for it, um, because it's going to be different for everyone. And now I'm going to pick up and do a few more of those comments and answer a few more of those specific situations. And then we're going to talk about kind of the segue of that. Can trial through a problem or should you take a break from competing to fix the problem so we're going to kind of look at some different things um so if if the screen is blurry to, and you can't see me that well because it's it's okay as long as you can hear me you'll be fine um <clears throat> okay so coming back one of the questions and i'm i don't think i got to this one is how to interpret when the dog is just having an off day and if it's inconsistent <clears throat> so if if your dog sometimes like just knocks it out of the park and is having a great time and it doesn't show any signs of stress things like that and sometimes it is showing some signs of stress that to me or or having issues kind of internally and not in any consistent way that you can kind of nail down a pattern to, then I would definitely, my go-to would be some sort of or illness that's maybe just having some different flare-ups. Maybe he, you know, he start if there's a little bit of time, um, maybe it kind of heals and then he, the dog can get re-injured, things like that. Um, obviously, it can be more complicated than that, but when it's not consistent, my my gut feeling is um, injury or illness. And, and then, um, oh, by the way, if you just have if you have questions about any of this, as I kind of read the comments and give my um, completely biased opinion. Um, on just the short little synopsis that I'm reading, just pop them into the chat and I'll, I'll do my best to keep up with both. <laughs> um, is how do you know your training or if the dog just isn't interested? Uh, the comment goes on to say, what is the balance between increasing motivation and recognizing the dog is kind of, uh, for instance, my dog is confident in competition about the day itself, whether at home or in a class setting, specifically thinking about how he responds to agility and knows where field thing. Um, 
This is a great question uh, because I do think that as a whole, be more realizations of what the dog can bring to the table. Um, a lot of the times, especially where agility agility is involved, is we're looking for right. It's a uh, sport against the clock, so to speak. So we we tend to want to breaking up a lot. Is anyone else having an issue? Like, I don't want to be like, well, too bad for this one person. But if I want to know if it's a me issue or a everyone. So let me know if the sound is okay. All right. The sound is not okay. Mm. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, to, it's okay if it is a me issue. It usually is because my internet is craptastic. Um, I'm going to turn my video off and let me know if that helps. So now it should, it's probably going to be black screen, maybe with some in and out, like a speaker moving. Is that helping? Is that improving? I actually have a really good, uh, right now, better than normal, actually. So hopefully, uh, hopefully. Hopefully turning the video off kind of just takes the strain off of it and this can make it better. Okay, excellent. So pretend it's a podcast. You don't need to see me anyways. Um, okay, super. Yeah, the video, so it, it's basically what it's saying is it was, it's going to give you one or the other, a pretty picture or a pretty sound and you need pretty sound. So here we are. Um, so in agility, because we are, so interested in speed, we can sometimes have unrealistic expectations about what the dog is capable or likely to give us. So we can use motivators that the dog likes, but there is going to be a threshold, a limit to the amount of speed that we see. And we tend to uh, kind of define speed by these labels that kind of come as enthusiasm and things like that. Um, so for sure, if you're doing other sports and the dog, it has a clear um, liking to one over the other, then, you know, you can decide, well, he, he, you know, he doesn't really, he's not really interested in this sport. Or you can just accept that the dog isn't going to be as interested in agility as he would be in field sports. I know for sure that I get a completely different level of intensity out of my border collies when I take them herding versus agility, but they still really enjoy agility. The same with my terriers. If I were to take them and, and hunt for quarry, they would be, it would be in, in a different amount of intensity and enthusiasm. And if you can find ways of motivating them that carry over a little bit more easily, then sure, you're probably going to get a little bit of that intensity into your sports. But it's also okay if your dog is super intense for some sports and not so intense for other sports. I wouldn't necessarily say to give up on that one or that quitting is the answer there, unless it is. Just depends on what you want agility to look like. Um, the next one, I have a very drivey dog with start line and anxiety issues around other dogs. She is two and I've spent here working on trying to develop a solid start line stay with not a lot of success given the many, many training hours spent. She also gets very anxious when other dogs invade her three foot bubble zone. She loves the game, but the other factors make me wonder if trialing is a realistic goal and possibly just too stressful given her personality. So this specific issue happens more often than you think. And Barbara is the one, Barbara Lee is uh, the one who commented 
um, a few weeks ago. And this, I see this all the time where dogs are just melting on the start line for this reason. And it can ruin the rest of agility for the dog 100%. Um, so we do want to try to avoid that if we can. So you've got options, right? You can eliminate the start line stay. You can just take that out of the picture completely if, if that's okay with you. So that would kind of be option one. Option two, or I actually think this is maybe option one. They're, they're both options. I would potentially get rid of the start line for right now. Then I would also seek out other training opportunities for dealing with that type of pressure, right? The stand for exam and obedience comes to mind for me is I would be going through um, a training plan for that type of skill and then applying it to the start line. Obviously having to take it a little bit further um, about dogs and things like that. But for sure, if, if the, the environment has so much and anxiety, then maybe it's not worth it. It, it all depends, really. And that is definitely and it, there's a little bit over here in the two topics that I want to cover tonight, but I for sure wouldn't be asking the dog to do the start line in competition if I wanted to continue competing. I would absolutely eliminate the start line in any um, formal agility environment until you addressed the anxiety piece of it. Um, Cheryl asks, is it a training issue or is it just not the right sport for your dog? Um, it's so hard. It's so hard to know for sure. But um, one thing that I, I think if the issue is only coming up at trials, it's a training issue. But if dog is never pleased agility or never into agility, then I would say it's not the right sport. I don't understand the question, what's more start line than start line? Did I say something that was unclear? Unpack that question for me a little bit more. Um, so, like I was saying, if it only shows up in trials, it's probably a training issue. And it could very well be the mental issue on your part. It doesn't have to necessarily be um, a technical training issue either. All right. So, I'm skimming the next one. Um, how do you cope with missing the sport so much when you are not actively competing? Oh man, that one just, let's just drive a stake right through me. All right. Whew. Um, this, uh, this question, I can just say my own experience. Obviously, <laughs> I I kind of pivoted and I put a lot of effort into training in a different sport. Like when we first discussed this, I talked about how I started doing team obedience skills with Shrek, and that really really helped because then I could pour my, my training energy into something else. And then I could also continue working towards some sort of title and achievement, which was his team level one title. And, and so that, that helped for sure. And teaching helped for sure. Talking about agility, um, it's still helping. I say this like, 
I'm currently competing, but it helps to keep yourself involved in other ways and then potentially just take up some other new habit you can energy into. For, for me, it's my fitness workouts. I can just throw all, all of my competitive edgy feelings into that and that helps me immensely. And then the second part of your question was what are some ways um, use obstacles as part of your fitness to handle the whole picture. Um, I would just train that dog. I would just train it as if you uh oh can you guys still hear me? I would just use, I would just train the dog as if Okay, perfect. Excellent. Um, because it told me you guys couldn't. It was like, you're having connection issues and said you couldn't hear me. All right. Um, so if you weren't going to compete and you were taking a break from competing, I would just, but the dog enjoys like training, then I would just keep training that dog as if you were going to compete. And that would be both enrichment and a little bit of exercise for that dog. Okay, someone says that going to trials without a dog was in, was surprisingly enjoyable. It sounds weird, but I actually liked it. You know, I, I think a lot of people probably would enjoy that because then you get that social experience as well. You can have in the ring, maybe you mentor a novice person. I think there's a lot, um, a lot to gain from that as well. Um, okay, so if you're just joining, there is no video. We're trying to keep the sound from breaking up. And so we had to choose video or sound and we chose sound. Um, I've got a couple more comments to get through and then we're gonna swap topics. Um, what signal should we be looking for at various points surrounding around the indicate dog is or is not having fun? Um, this is going to be super individual for every dog. Obviously, the most like obvious bit would be that the dog is actively trying to leave the ring. That would pretty much indicate to me that they are no longer having fun. Then the next bit would be that they're maybe kind of just looking around, like they're looking for an exit sign. They're looking for the nearest path to the exit. And then above that, it would be that maybe they, they're they going, you, you, know, you know what your dog looks like when they're just not happy. And I'm not saying every dog has to be like, oh my gosh, this is Disneyland to be competing. That's our goal, but it's also okay with me if it's okay with you if they're not, as long as it's not hurting them to do it. But everyone knows what their dog looks like when they are or are not having fun. So that's just something I would pay attention to. Like if they're doing everything the exact same way that they do in class, but you just don't think it looks like they're happy, then I think then you're probably overthinking it. Um, so don't look, but so always be aware of your dog's body language and behavior, but don't go looking for a problem that might not be there. Um, Kimberly says you can also pick up a run or two with your friend's dog sometimes if you go to a trial without a dog to run. That is an excellent point. Um, I could probably just show up at a trial and be like, who wants me to run their dog? <laughs> and I would be very, very busy. Okay, and then this one is kind of um, 
similar. How do you know they don't like it if they're hot and cold? Um, a little bit, uh, I answered this a little bit a while ago about maybe this is injury or illness, but also a little bit similar to the previous question or how do you make sure they're having fun? <laughs> and you do, you do the best you can. You try to set them up for, for having fun. Like everything should be a game. Your training session should be well structured and they should be well prepared. Um, it's going to be way more fun for everyone involved when they're really, really prepared. And this um, does go a little bit back to some cultural fog of, well, agility is just fun because it's agility, because it's not obedience or it's not confirmation. It's fun because agility. And that's just not true. Not all dogs, not all people are having fun with agility just because it's a fun sport. So there's... There's a lot, I think, uh, cultural fog to that, that agility is a good confidence builder. It can be, but it's not necessarily. Um, so this is kind of a good segue into the, should I trial through this problem or should I take a break thing? Because I see it all the time. Dogs kind of start off competing going, I don't know about this. It's really different. This isn't how it usually looks, right? This doesn't look like training. This is different. I see my obstacles. And they start out a little bit tentative. And you know, it used to be that you just trial through that. Well, they'll get confident. They're just baby dogs. Oh, that's just a baby dog thing. And, and things like that. And I think some things I've decided, I've given it some thought, I think some skills we can kind of trial through and just have the dog have experience and gain confidence that way. And then there are other things that I don't think we should be trialing through because they're gaining the wrong experience. So remember, you guys wanted to write it down and put it on a t-shirt. Don't get good at something by continuing to do the thing you're not good at, right? So things, think of it this way. If your dog is rehearsing the wrong behavior and you have no control over it, you should not be trialing through it. So things that come to mind for me are zooming. You can't prevent it on an agility course because you have to take the leash off. So you can't trial through that problem. Visiting the ring crew. Again, you have to take the leash off so you can't control it. So that's going to be harder to train through. Um, so the things that are typically related to the dog not being prepared for the environment, I would not trial through those things. I would take a break have a training plan, retest in three months or six months or a year, depending on the severity of the issue. But that I would be so careful about the dog rehearsing those issues, which is why Shrek has been in like four or five trials, basically one or two a year for the last three or four years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One or two trials a year for the past three, nothing this last year, obviously. Um, so he's been in a handful of trials because it's a test and then you go back to the drawing board and a test and you go back to the drawing board and a test and you go back to the drawing board and it takes as long as it takes. Those things you don't want to trial through because the dog is rehearsing it. If every time you take the leash off, the dog may or may not zoom, that is a very high risk issue. Because every time the dog does zoom, they are rehearsing that they zoom in the competition environment. Or if every time you take the leash off, they visit the scribe table, they're rehearsing that. So you really want to be careful that you're not letting the dog rehearse things that you don't want to see in the future. Now let's talk about obstacle skills. So I, this is where I think it gets interesting. And... 
it, it depends because we can't actually control if they are going to weave all the poles or not, right? Or we can't control if they're going to stop on the teeter or not, right? So we can and we can't. If, if you've got a dog with pretty solid skills, but they just need a little bit more help or support in the environment, I'm okay to trial through that problem because that's a small problem <laughs> because you're still probably actively training that dog to be able to do the weave bowls or the contacts more independently. Okay, are we following the difference? So if I just kind of noticed, if I, if I went out and I walked a run and I tried to move laterally away from my weave poles and my dog popped out. They did it once, okay, no big deal. That's not a problem, that's just something that happened. Well then, so a couple runs later, I did something similar and the dog popped out again. And I'm going, okay, that's a thing. I want to make sure that I don't allow that to happen again, if I can help it. And remember, it's when, um, Allowing it in my head means I'm going to manage it. So I'm going to try and prevent it from happening, not set it up to happen so I can correct it. So I'm gonna try my hardest in the next runs to just not move laterally from the weave poles. And I'm going to help my dog be successful in that environment because the dog has told me he cannot do it. And then I'm gonna make that a big, note in my notebook and go home and I'm going to see what I can do to try and put some more reinforcement in that bank. And then I'm going to very, very slowly increase the criteria of my dog's weave poles at trials over time. People tend to get stuck though in the helping bit. They say, well, I can leave my dog a hundred feet in the weave poles at home, but I can't do that here. And one or it had error one or two times, and then our brains say, "Well, it, it always happens." Every time I move laterally out of the laterally away from the weaves, they pull out. Well, no, they don't. Even given them a fair shot. So those types of things, if you just want to give a little bit of support to help your dog experience that, yeah, you can do this here, that's different than if your dog has never seen the weave poles before and you're like, weave, do this now. You can't trial through something that they don't know how to do, I guess is the simplest way I can put it. But if you can help them just a little, and give them that experience of, yes, you can do this, you'll be able to increase the criteria much faster. But you have to make sure that you do not get stuck in helping them forever. Because what happens then is that the cue changes and the dog learns that, well, in competition, in this environment, in this context, my handler is not allowed to leave my side. And so the dog gets used to you being next to the weaves and then it becomes a superstition and then the cycle just repeats itself, repeats itself, repeats itself. All right. All right. Someone says that makes sense. Boom. I like that. Um, someone else says, realize today I'm not rewarding enough in training. That's what training is about, is refilling those reinforcement histories that competing pulls from. Okay, competitions literally and figuratively suck the money out of our bank accounts. So you have to, during the week, literally and figuratively refill your bank account so you can go right back on the weekend and empty it again. And your goal is to start out so wealthy in your reinforcement histories that competing doesn't put you in debt.
which might be the number one reason to not debut a dog as soon as they're legally able to compete because they haven't been alive long enough for you to have robust reinforcement histories. If you're competing on 50, if you're competing at 15 months, well, let's say your dog was done growing at, let's just say it was easy, like the, like Torch, he's done growing. I'm using air quotes. He's going to fill out, but he's done growing, right? He's like six and a half steps old. He's done growing. So let, let's just say he was doing full height, everything by the time he was a year old, because I still have to be training him to do it, right? Let's say he was doing full height, everything at a year old, and I debuted him at 15 months, three months long enough for your reinforcement histories to be overflowing. Then their first few trials would bankrupt you. And I know we've pivoted a little bit, but yes, we should put that on a t-shirt. Competitions literally and figuratively suck the money out of your bank accounts. So think about that too. If you have a young dog, you, of course you're putting enforcement history in the bank for these skills as you're training them, but it's different when now you're sequencing with them and now you're doing courses with them and now you're doing, you know, then different environments. A trial, a trial teeter might cost you way more than a training teeter just because the environment, you know, because the environment is like a fancy label. It's a, it's a name brand teeter now and name brand teeters cost more than generic teeters. Is this an, am I, am I still okay to use this analogy? So you have to really, really take a look at where you're putting the, the money in the bank. I don't know. I feel like I kind of pivoted and went on a little bit of a tangent about reinforcement, but here we are. Um, okay. So do you have questions? Let's, yeah, let's take some questions. I'm going to make sure that I got the questions from the group. And I think I did. Okay. So while you all think of your questions, I'm going to hop over to the Patreon page and see if there are some questions over there that I can answer. And if you don't know about it, I now have a Patreon page that you can become a patron on. How do I get to... Here we go. This is what I want. Okay, because I think this is relevant. Um, I had a question from the page. Can you use for handling dogs who are currently moving slower than expected through a course? All right. Um, do you slow pace to be able to match theirs relative to where you both would be if the dog was running? Cheerlead. Do you try to fake run to encourage some speed? things like that, run on the outside of a curve. Um, appreciations of all these suggestions, but I'm curious about your general thoughts on this issue. So let's decide first if this is, a if this is an issue that we should trial through or take a break from. And, and so it depends. If the dog knows how to run, if the dog is 
pretty comfortable in the environment, but it's just a little bit of pressure and they just need a little bit of help to know. This is where you have to be really, really careful with understanding why the dog is running more slowly in competition than in training. Because if you then try cheerleading, that pressure to go faster. Okay. And if the dog is already kind of slow going slower because they feel pressure, adding to that is going to be really, really difficult. Right. Um, so always think of is it cheer is cheerleading like, yeah, wait, you're doing it. You're doing great. Let's keep going. I'm so proud of you. Or is cheerleading all right, let's go. One more lap. Let's do this. Let's go. Come on. Keep it up. Knees up. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Both of that is motivating, right? Both of those types of cheerleading are motivators, but one is based in, wow, you're doing great. I'm so proud of you. And one of, and the other is based in, you better do this or else. Right. Does that make sense? And I'm really sorry if gym class feelings are coming up for you at the moment. I'm really sorry. Um, fake running. Again, you don't want to do something that your dog is feeling like, oh, my goodness, they're acting really weird. I don't know what to do with this. So I, I guess the, the short answer is <laughs> you don't want you, you don't want to do things that the dog isn't used to seeing because that's going to potentially confuse them. It's going to make you stuck doing that because let's say the dog likes it. Now the dog's like, yeah, I really like that. You're going to be stuck doing that because that's part of the cue process now. And, that, and then the dog is going to expect it and want more of it. Uh, and then kind of the same for handling the outside of the curve of a, of a course, that to me is probably the safest because you can still kind of handle normally. You can move at your own speed and your normal pace and you're not being weird. You're just using a different handling strategy that allows you to show more movement. Now, if this isn't happening in training, then I would definitely say it's an environment kind of thing, putting pressure on the dog. So as long as it's not debilitating, like the dog is still generally ha happy to be there, then I think this is okay to try competing through. Would, however, do some experimenting with how many like days in a row you're trialing or how many runs in a day. Are they better in the morning? Are they better in the afternoon? Are they better if their runs are spaced far apart? Are they better if their runs are back to back? I would do some experimenting there to see if you can kind of find the sweet spot for that particular dog and compete during that sweet spot to show them, hey, look, you can go fast here. And then see if you can stretch that out and replicate that in other ways. If the dog is not wanting to be there, then of course you don't want to trial through this issue. Um, and then in training, if the dog is going slow, I would take away the ability to run. And of course you, you did mention that your current interest is for student and 4-H dogs and kids are really good at just running fast and being really energetic. So if the dog likes that, then they should use that. But they should also use it in training, not just in competition. And then if in training the dog is slow, my it's not nearly as much fun, especially when you're working with kids. But when the dog is slow in training, I take away the handler's ability to run. Because sometimes what happens is the dog's like, oh, they're always ahead of me. I don't have any reason to run. I just need to go as fast as they go. But when you start walking, walking. Now the dog doesn't want to walk next to you. The dog wants to get to the end where the rewards are. So typically when I want to build speed, I actually take speed away from the, from the handler. So now it's not a race. The dog can win every single time. 
So that question was from Abby over at Patreon. And that was a great one to unpack during tonight's talk. Um, all right, so we're gonna go grab some more Facebook comments and I'm gonna need a couple more questions because we've got about 20 more minutes I can fill. Um, this comment, my dog slows way down when nervous, sometimes to a trot, not even a run. She's not a very fast dog anyway, she's a bouncy runner. So then what you can try, I mean, it's gonna be a good tell for you. Then if you know nervous, she slows down, this is really common for a lot of dogs then you can try kind of choosing how you run, like how much of the course you run to try and uh, make it so that in a competition, if let, this is just completely hypothetical, but let's say she she's able to run 13 obstacles super fast and confident, like normal for her. And then obstacles 14, 20 are kind of meh. So I would actually be okay trialing through this if you are willing to um, shorten your, your courses. So if I was going to, let's say I'm going to do four runs over the weekend, I would say 13 is my maximum. And I would only ask for 13 obstacles one time through the entire weekend of, let's say, four runs. I would ask for way less. I would ask for close to 13. I would ask for, so I might ask for like four obstacles, nine obstacles, five obstacles, 13 obstacles. And I would always randomize it. Sometimes the highest number of obstacles is first. Sometimes the highest obstacles is last or in the middle somewhere and things like that. What typically ha happens, this is another warning sign of trialing through problems. Is a, is a lot of times when the problem is the dog slows down like this, they are still accurate enough to qualify. And that reinforces the human for just allowing this to continue. And it's a little bit dangerous because you, again, we don't want to rehearse the problem unless we're okay with the problem happening over and over again. So if dog slowing down is a problem for you, then you want to try and set up your competition runs that don't allow it to happen. So it doesn't happen. So the dog isn't rehearsing it. So ping ponging the number of obstacles that they're being asked to do in a competition environment is a really, would be a better idea than just letting them continue to be low when they're a little bit nervous. You are trying to assess if things are getting better as you trial through how much do you weigh multiple runs the same day versus multiple days of competition versus multiple weekends. Um, meaning, I mean, I would probably work up. So if I'm if I'm trialing through something, I'm going to start with very little trialing because I want to make sure my success rate is really high. So I might do one run one day once a month. That's maybe like the bare minimum. And then I might do two runs one day twice a month, something like that. And then I would increase from there because what I want to see is that my success rate is either staying at 100% or if it started lower than 100% that it's going up. Um, but if, but if say I'm going to trial through it, but I'm still going to do three days a weekend and three runs a day, and I'm going to trial twice a month, that's a lot of pressure. And also a lot of my time rehearsing potentially a cue that I don't want to use long term. So if I'm trialing often, I want to be taking good data and making sure that I'm increasing the criteria often. Because if I'm not able to increase the criteria, then either the dog doesn't do the job and I need to, to stop trialing and train this better, or I just need to be okay with this is how it's going to be kind of long term. Did that answer the question? I wasn't, I'm not totally sure. Um, I see the, the comment about the nipping. It's a little bit off topic for tonight um but 
it's a little bit the same. If you, if the dog playing with your brother-in-law increase the behavior again, now you have to go back and refill that reinforcement history for not nipping. So then you have to get out and run around a little bit with him and reward him for not nipping. So run, take two or three steps at a run and reinforce him before he gets the idea to jump up and nip, things like that. So you always wanna be looking for the things that you do want and rewarding for that. Um, okay, next question. Good. I'm glad that some more questions are coming in. Thoughts on trialing through terrier stop and sniff mid run? Or is that similar training issue like zoomies? I would be very careful about it. I mean, I guess my answer is do you see Shrek in the ring? Uh, <laughs> I would be very careful about it. Because it's one of you can't, can't control it. You can't help it right if if i so i might i might look at it this way it depends on what is causing it so first what's causing it so a lot of times stopping and sniffing can just be handling the dog's like i have zero idea how to follow that. So I'm going to turn to dirt because dirt has never lied to me. Um, there is, oh my gosh, do you know who was here last Tuesday? Wow, they smell good. I bet they had a cheeseburger on their way to class. There's, I really get myself up when I'm thinking about terriers. Um, and then there's, this is just too hard of an, an environment for me and I can't handle it and I don't know what else to do. So I'm going to turn to dirt because dirt is always there for me. Um, but let's just assume it's, it's like the dog just doesn't, can't help themselves and they're not really stressed out. They're just kind of generally curious and maybe there's some handling issues that can clean it up that would help it. But the dog is not in distress. Let's just assume that. If I can be, if I can very quickly interrupt it and the dog can happily come back to work, I might just interrupt it and keep going. But then I'm going to make sure that it's not continuing to happen. So the first time it ha happens, it's just like anything else the first time it happens. Oh, he's a dog. He's allowed to make mistakes. Not a mission. If it happens again, now I'm going to be like, well, I need to make sure that this doesn't happen a third time. Because now a third time is a pattern. Right? Once, no big deal. Twice, it's on my radar. Three times, oh my gosh, I've got to change this. Because now it's starting to be a habit. Especially when it's reinforcing like sniffing or zooming or visiting people, all of those things. So I can interrupt it and keep going. That's going to be my go-to, but then that's what happens in the moment. We know that with any error, the magic happens with what you do next. I'm going to pay very close attention to why is the stopping and sniffing happening? Is it connected to a specific obstacle? Is it connected to a specific handling maneuver that I do? Is it connected to a, the number of obstacles that we've done? Is it connected to the amount of time we've been on the course? And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And if I can't do that, then I can't trial through it because I need to be able to control it if I'm going to trial through it. Does that make sense? Um, if the issue is like the first time I'm on a new teeter, better to practice novel teeter one run once a month or better to practice multiple chances of the novel teeter over the same week in a new location? Well, 
<laughs> it depends. It's a, it, it, you do have to know your, your dog really, really well, I think, because if, if they're going to potentially have a bad reaction to that teeter, then then you're not going to want to do it again. Right? If the dog experience was bad on that teeter, you're going to want time away from that teeter. You're not going to want to turn them around and make them do it again in the next run or the next day. You want time. You want time for that trauma. I'm going to use that word loosely, but I think it fits here. If the dog has a negative experience with that obstacle, making them do it again, essentially relive, you're, re, you're having them relive that trauma. Um, and, and so then they just trust you. Not only will they not trust any teeter for the rest of their lives, they won't trust you actually. Um, but if the dog has great experience, if the dog is generally confident and you don't think the dog has a fear, it just needs experience. So the dog has an okay experience on that teeter one time, then doing it again in the same weekend is probably going to be fine. I would not, that's not my preference to introduce the dog to novel things and competition. I would, my preference, my goal would be that if my dog is the type of needs to see different types of teeters, I would be trying to do that in uh, training and ring rentals and dropping into other classes if you have to. I would want the dog to have that experience in an environment that you can control. So if you are concerned about your dog's reaction to a teeter, when I do them in different places for the first time, I'm making it so that it barely tips or it barely bangs or I'm trying to control the as many variables as I can to make sure that that dog has a good experience and I can't do that in a trial. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so we have time for maybe one more question, maybe two if they're really quick. So I'm going to give you guys just a second to get those up. Dirt has never lied to me, should be the terrier motto or any dog's motto, really. I, um, I be like dirt is kind of my thing when do you, <laughs> because it's a, it's a cultural fog like myth. Maybe you've been told this, but you've been told to be more exciting than dirt or be more exciting than a squirrel. Have you been told that before? It's okay. I'll wait. You can all raise your hands. I'm talking about all of us. At some point in our dog training and especially agility careers, we've probably been told be more exciting than dirt. Be more exciting than grass. Be more interesting than grass. Be more interesting than a squirrel. It doesn't exist. You can't be more exciting than dirt. You can't be more exciting than grass. You cannot be more interesting than a squirrel to a dog. You can't. Let it go. Give it up. Pick up a new hobby. <laughs> you can't. I want you to be like dirt. You know why? Dirt doesn't lie to dogs. Dirt is always there for dogs. Dirt is always reinforcing for dogs. dogs dirt is consistent. Grass, always there, always reinforcing, always giving freely. Squirrels, holy moly, living up to all dogs' dreams. They're fast. They run. They're interesting. Don't try to outdo dirt, grass, squirrels. Just be predictable. Dirt is predictable. It's consistent. It's there for them. When they need something, they turn to dirt. Why aren't they turning to you for something? That's, trust me, I am not preaching to you. I'm probably preaching a little bit to myself because I live this uh, every day with Shrek. In whatever environment that I go in, it is not be more interesting than what he's interested in. It's be more predictable than. Be more accessible. Ask yourself, why does the 
dog was a dog like dirt because it's consistent. Be like dirt. You bet just energy dark sports be like dirt. I have it somewhere. Um, Amy Cook made me, um, if you've seen her play as magic, little keychain, she made me one that says be like dirt. And if you've been to our plus 2.0 training camp, it has um, a saying from each of the instructors. And, and mine's, I'm not on the t-shirt yet. I want to be on the t-shirt if we ever have a camp again. But mine would be like dirt. You just have to be consistently reinforcing, predictably reinforcing. You don't have to be more interesting than dirt. Just be reinforcing. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk slash rant slash passion speak. Any last questions? I can take one more before we wrap this up. <laughs> we are going to make the t-shirts that say be like dirt. All right. I'll give you guys just a few more minutes, seconds, really. And yeah, this was a good chat. I think we covered a lot of ground. If you're listening to this after the fact and you have a question, just you know, drop it into the group. We can keep the discussion going. Um, I have a lot of the line right now. I'm giving you guys a minute to get your questions in. Uh, a lot of things available online right now now the agility handlers mechanics class is still open for registration through the 15th uh, so you can grab that six-week course we're just laying the foundation for the micro skills this week and we'll start putting those together um, next week i have the how to handle errors workshop that's live so people are able to watch the presentation now and ask their questions through sunday I also have the obstacle focus versus handler focus webinar is available for sale. So if you're interested in that, um, it's all of that's on the FDSA website. And the new thing, of course, the Patreon page, if you would like to become a patron for $5 a month, you're supporting this group. You're supporting the content that we that I create here. You're supporting um, more content being created and you're getting up, <laughs> you're, you have the opportunity to ask a few more questions and kind of get a little bit more things answered there. And I'll probably take the questions there and I'll start using the questions posted there to fuel the content. So that gives you that kind of perk to make sure that your questions get answered. You also get access to Synergy Dog Sports merchandise. So putting my logo on everything you own, that sounds like a good idea. And for $20 a month, you're gonna get a little bit more access. You're gonna get a, an adult monthly live where I'm training in front of you. So patrons at that level are able to post what they would like to see me train. And I'm going to choose one a month to go live and train that with either Shrek or Torch or maybe both. And um, otherwise, if it's not something that I would train live or could train live, just depending on where we are, then I might have a video that I'll just share there as a training session of those things. So a little bit more access to me and my training can be can be um, accessed through Patreon. Um, someone says they just signed up while I was ranting. Excellent. Well, I'm glad I inspired you to hear more of my ranting. I mean, talking. Um, okay. So no more questions came in while I was talking about all the things that you can pay me money for. So I'm going to wrap this up. I don't think the pick for next week has been decided, but... Um, we'll let you know by Friday, for sure. 
All right, thank you everyone for being here and your questions, and this was a great discussion. And thanks for helping me work through the technology, of course, so it seems like this worked out to just do it without a video. I'll see you all later.